Welcome to Northview Community Church. Whether you're part of our Northview family or here as a guest, I'm glad you're here with us this week. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Freddie, and I'm part of the Immerse program here at Northview. Immerse is a program that our church runs to equip the next generation of leaders. If you've not been around Northview very long, what we want to be about is multiplication. We exist to multiply disciples, and the best way to do that is in healthy local churches across Canada and the world. As most of you are already aware, we do have a kids video that's available. And as an update, it's now available Saturday mornings for you to watch. Last week, we promised you an update regarding what North is doing in our community in this time of crisis. For that update, we will turn to Pastor Josh. All right, I'm here with Joshua, and we're just going to get right into it. Tell us a little bit about Northview Cares. So Northview Cares is an initiative that we've put together as a church to essentially just serve our community uh, and love our neighbor. Yeah, so one of the primary ways is uh, a hamper ministry that we're doing uh, in partnership with a local public school that's actually in central Abbotsford, which is why I'm here talking to you. Um, so we gather together fresh uh, food, fresh produce, fresh dairy, fresh egg, all sorts of stuff, and gather it together in a hamper, which we then uh, bring to this local school, and they're distributing it out to those who have need. So how can we, as the church, be more involved? So there's, there's two key ways that we can be involved. Uh, first is just by giving. So we have our care fund, and part of that care fund is going toward these campers. We're using that money to purchase uh, the materials that's gonna go into these and go to the families. But the other way is just tangibly serving, hands and feet. Um, we need people to help us gather these hampers together to take the material to the, the local public school. So uh, there's both just the on the ground practical things, but, but giving is also really important. So how do we learn more? How do we sign up to help or to give? Yeah, so on our website, we have a Northview Cares page. Um, and on that, on that page is all the different ways that we're serving our community. There's not just the hampers, there's all sorts of ways. But on that page, there is a, a button that you can click to say, get help if, if you're kind of in the position of needing help. Uh, you can click that and fill out the form, or you can click the button Give Help. If you're wanting to serve by giving or you're wanting to serve by showing up and helping, uh, that's where you're gonna wanna go. All right, that's awesome. And if you have seen me before, you know I'm a big advocate of text to give and giving to the Care Fund, so let's continue to do that so we can support this new initiative. I love to see that our church is engaging in our community and meeting the practical needs of, of those around us. Now, we're going to transition into a time of singing led by Pastor Andrew and the team. So join me, raise those hands, let loose some amens and some come ons as we worship our God. Look, as we join together in worship today, can I encourage you to be here, be present with us? Maybe that means pausing this video for just a minute and praying that God's Spirit would focus your mind and your attention on Him. Maybe that means putting down your phone for a minute or two and just being here and worshiping with God's people. We're gonna read the Lord's Prayer together, so join with us as Shalan does that. Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one.
I love singing hymns. I hope you enjoyed that song as much as I did. We're going to continue our sermon series here in the book of Esther. Pastor Mark is going to lead us through Esther 3. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, feel free to turn there right now and follow along as we get into God's word together. It's great to be together again. And as Freddie mentioned, we are carrying on in our study of the book of Esther, week 3, chapter 3. But before we dive in, I want to just make a comment about a great online resource that our discipleship ministry team has put together. It's a daily devotional through the book of Esther 
working through the same text that we're studying on the weekends. And it's a great way for us to be studying simultaneously. And it would be really interesting to know, as you have been processing this devotional with observations and applications, if you have some of the same thoughts that I've had in my study this week. But of course, I get the microphone, so it's my study that matters. As we pick up our text today, the storyline turns dark as we meet the primary antagonist in this story. And if you can roll back the clock in your mind and remember your English literature class in junior high, you'll know that every story has several key parts. Regardless of the genre, fiction, nonfiction, could be mystery, biography, romance, westerns, fantasy novels. But great stories follow a surprisingly predictable pattern. They all contain some key elements. Obviously, a list of characters and a time and a place and a setting. Maybe the past, maybe the present, maybe even the future. And at the root, there is always some struggle between good and evil, right and wrong. So the story is set up. Here are the people that you need to know. Here is what their lives are on about. Once upon a time in a land far, far away. But then enters into the story a crisis or a conflict of some sort, some person or some circumstance that comes up against our characters. It might be an enemy attack. It might be a natural disaster, maybe a global pandemic, some tragedy that faces our characters. And the rest of the story is the struggle. The tension, the question, how is this going to resolve itself? And as the outside observer, as we're reading it or watching it, we inherently want the good guy to win. We want there to be a satisfying resolution to this crisis. We want it to end with, they lived happily ever after. Esther follows the classic lines of a great story. The setting is a Middle Eastern empire with an egotistical king who loves to display his power and glory. I think that engraved on the inside of his crown are the words, make Persia great again. We've met his beautiful wife, Vashti, a woman who dares to have her own opinion, who opposes the king and she pays the ultimate price. She has to be shut up and shut out. We've met young Esther, who like it or not, is drawn into an ancient version of speed dating or the bachelorette. A commoner who finds herself married to the king, a rags to riches story. We've met her cousin Mordecai, who has raised her and who has been her advisor. And there's a few supporting cast, extras, the king's servants and advisors. But today we meet a very important character. Our story's antagonist, a man named Haman. And he is a scoundrel. He's probably a narcissist. He's certainly insecure. And we see his rise to power, and it is a bad thing. So, as is our typical way, we're going to open our Bibles. We're going to walk through the text. I'm going to make some comments and observations, and then we'll circle back around again near the end and try to make some applications. So, Esther 3 verse 1 says, After these events... King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamathada, the Agite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. The first three words give us the setting after these events, the events of chapters one and two. After Xerxes' six-month display of power and glory and his seven-day drink fest. After Vashti says no to the king, after the royal beauty contest, after Mordecai has uncovered a plot to assassinate the king, and time is ticking away. If you're reading carefully, you'll see that there are some dates in the book. Chapter one is in the third year of Xerxes' reign. Chapter two, four years later, Esther is crowned queen. And now in chapter 3, another five years have come and gone. But the main point is this. Xerxes has a new right-hand man, Haman the Agite. And as we will learn very quickly, he is not Haman the humble or Haman the humanitarian, 
but rather we might call him Haman the horrible or Haman the hateful or Haman the heinous or whatever other kind of H word you could come up with. Verse 2 says, All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate ask Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet, having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai, Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. There are several questions worth asking or things worth taking note in those few verses. The first one's interesting that the king orders everyone to bow in respect. And in that time and place, people might wonder why. Uh, Several commentators make note that that would have been an unusual command in an Eastern culture because everyone would have known that they should bow to a superior. The command was unnecessary. Uh, One commentator says this, there's no reason assigned for this order, which was certainly unusual since the prostration of an inferior to a superior was a general rule. Perhaps Haman had been elevated from a very low position and the king therefore sought a special order was needed. You see, everyone in that time and place knew that the minions would bow to the king's official. It's like the staff room around Northview. We inherently know that when Dr. Bucknam walks into the room, we all stand in respect. We just know. The text gives us a hint. He's Haman the Agite. He's not Haman the Persian or Haman the Mede or Haman the Babylonian. Haman's a foreigner. He is one of the conquered people groups of those 127 provinces from India to Egypt. Just as Esther has risen to influence, Haman the Agite has risen to influence. And whatever the reason, the king has decided to make it very clear to everyone that I have elevated a man, not unlike yourselves, to a position of power. Make sure you bow to him. Maybe Haman even asked for the command. But we get our first glimpse of how much public perception mattered to Haman. Haman needed to be noticed. Haman needed to know people knew how important he was. Haman needed everyone to bow to him. If he were alive today, I am sure in our modern media day, Haman would be consumed with how many likes on Instagram and Facebook, how many followers on Twitter, how many people logged in last weekend to his State of the Empire address. And we see how easily his anger is ignited when he has not shown the respect and the honor that is due him. Everyone bows, we're told in verse 2, but one. And we're not told why for sure, but for some reason Mordecai refuses. And these verses raise a really fascinating rabbit trail that would be fun to go down if we had time, but let me just prime the pump for some of your private discussions. Why does Mordecai ignore the king's command? What justification does he have? And we could ask the question, when is it okay for people of faith to ignore a government decree? Romans 13 makes it explicitly clear that governments are set up and taken down by the Lord himself. And that in essence, to obey the government is to obey the Lord, that they're set up to punish evildoers and to protect those who do good. But Acts 5 gives us an example where the disciples chose to obey God over men. When the Sanhedrin told them, stop preaching the gospel, they said specifically, we must obey God, not man. Now, Mordecai, of course, didn't have the New Testament. But we know that Jeremiah had counseled these exiles. Several decades earlier, he had written a letter. 
And in essence, it said, I know that you believe that this is a horrific circumstance. Nebuchadnezzar drags you halfway across the desert to a foreign land, and I know that you've hung up your harps, you've hung up the electric guitars, I know that you are depressed, I know you don't want to worship, I know you feel tormented by your captors. But here's what the Lord says, I'm in this. I'm still on the throne. I'm still in control. And here's what I say to you. Settle in and be good citizens. Build homes and plant gardens and pray for this land. Because as this land prospers, so you too will prosper. It's a famous passage of scripture. We could have some really interesting debates. In fact, we could stir up a hornet's nest really quickly with this issue. When is it okay to disobey the government? Bow to Haman, the king said, and Mordecai says no. What if the government decided it was okay to kill the most vulnerable people in our nation? Would we stand up then? Here's a very interesting conversation. If you were to ask someone today in 2020, where is the most dangerous place on the planet to be living right now? More than likely, you would hear someone comment about the elderly who are living in seniors' homes because of COVID-19. And if you responded back to them and said, no, you're not nearly correct, I think you could stir up an interesting conversation. You see, if you told them, and it's actually at the opposite end of the spectrum, it is the very youngest among us, it is those who are still alive in their mother's womb. You see, in the first five months of this year, we have seen over 350,000 people die around the world of the COVID-19 virus. But in that same period of time, we have legally aborted over 17 million unborn children. 50 times the death rate of the coronavirus. For every person who succumbs to COVID-19, 50 unborn children have died so far this year. What if the government made laws that violate our biblical values of right and wrong? What if our government one day would redefine marriage and sexuality? What if on a more mundane level, the government would say churches can no longer meet, close them all down? Liquor stores and cannabis stores are essential services, but the church is not essential. What if something like that happened? When is civil disobedience justified. So let me just drop that little bomb into your living room and leave it with you. Back to our text. Haman is now the big man on campus, and the king says, bow. And Mordecai says, no. They pester him. He doesn't explain himself other than telling them that I'm a Jew. And implied in that statement is, as a Jew, I will not bow to that man. And right there, we get a hint of what's going on behind the scenes the story behind the story, and we got to put on our biblical detective hat. There's something more underneath the surface here, and we're going to come back to that in just a few moments. But in verse 4, Haman hears about it, and verse 5, he takes note. In other words, Haman hadn't even noticed until someone pointed it out to him. And what it tells us is that Mordecai wasn't making a huge deal about his protest. He wasn't carrying around anti-Haman placards through the streets. He wasn't jeering or drawing attention. He was just quietly standing to the side, not bowing. But once it's pointed out, Haman's fuse is lit. And his anger begins to burn. This horrible little man begins to strategize, how can I get rid of this man? And not just him, but his entire race throughout the entire kingdom. It clearly seems to be an overreaction by an insecure leader. You say to him, buddy, 99.9% .9 of the nation is bowing to you, and you're worried about that one guy who isn't? and it drives him crazy. His anger simmers away on the back burner, festering and smoldering and heating up day after day and month after month, and he casts lots for 11 months, waiting for the right time to make his move. He conspires and plots and rolls the dice. 
And we would surmise that each day he goes on about his business, coming and going from the palace, walking through the king's gate, and he watches every time, is that Mordecai there, that lone antagonist, the audacity, the very thought of it, does he not know who I am? Who does this old Jew think he's dealing with? And in the 12th month, he gets the green light. He sees something in that roll of the dice. It's time to go to the king. Verse 8. Haman said to King Xerxes, There's a certain people dispersed throughout the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other peoples, and they do not obey the king's laws. It's not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamathada, the the Agite, enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. You see, Haman could have said, King, there's this one guy out at the gate. But instead, he says, there is a people spread like a cancer throughout the entire empire. They live separately from the rest of us. They have their own ways. They're marching to the beat of a different drummer. They have a rebellious bent and they don't follow your laws. They think they're better than everyone else. They have a a, uh, superiority, a self-righteousness to them. They're going to cause civil unrest and others are going to listen and follow. It's not in your best interest that such a people should survive. And Haman's horrific plan comes out of the smoky back room. It is now public. The king slips off the signet ring off his finger in verse 10. He passes it to Haman, and he's basically saying, make it so. I'll trust you to do what you think is best. Here's my ring. Write what you need to write and seal it with my signet. Verse 12. On the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people, All Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors in the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods." A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. A full year has come and gone since Haman first noticed Mordecai not bowing. His anger has had 12 months to simmer, and the terrible brew is now ready to be poured out, and he calls his administrative assistants, take a memo from me in the languages of all the peoples of the kingdom. Eleven months from now, we will rid ourselves of the Jewish people entirely, annihilate them, men, women, children, young and old, and we will plunder their property. And it is sent out by express post. Now, there's one more little detail that we should take note of. It's significant. I don't know if you noticed the day that the decree was written. It was the 13th day of the first month. And it's interesting that Haman waited a full month to write the decree. For Jewish ears, that date would have stood out immediately. It would be like saying today, write that decree on June 30th for the Americans, for the Canadians, rather. Write it on July 3rd for the Americans. Write it on September 15th for the Mexicans. Or write it on December 24th for all of us. The point is the day before a major national celebration, right at the day before one of the most important events on the Jewish calendar, the day before Passover. 
You see, the Jews looked forward to three major festival weeks every year. And on the 14th day of the first month, they started a week of celebration marking Passover. And ironically, in the circumstance, Passover specifically remembers when God delivered them from Egypt. And on that very week, as they were preparing their Seder meals, as they were making plans for worship, as they were getting uh, ready for family gatherings and festivities, they get this devastating news, you have an appointment with death. It's another one of those instances in the book of Esther where we say, it just so happened. Or as we would say from our point of view, in God's providential plan. Chapter 3, verse 15, after a good day's work was done, the king says to Haman, hey buddy, why don't you come over and sit on the balcony and enjoy a glass of wine? We've taken care of that little problem, haven't we? So that's our story. We've met the great antagonist and we've seen the great crisis and it is really a dark chapter. And I want to go back and drill in a little bit further and an obvious question that many might ask is what is up with Haman? His response to Mordecai's actions seemed to be an overwhelming, overreaching, overreaction. Seriously, buddy, I get it. You are an important man. You're second in command. Your mama is proud. Your wife is proud. Your kids are proud. You have made it to the top of the heap. So I understand that it's important that everyone know how important you really are. But honestly, aren't you overreacting a teeny weeny bit? And here we got to put on our biblical detective hats and read thoughtfully and carefully. Because what is going on here really? What is the story behind the story? There's something much bigger than just a scuffle between these two men. It's not just Mordecai and Haman have offended one another. As we go back to verses 5 and 6, when Haman the Agite finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, the story takes a major shift. And it requires a deeper dive into the history books of the Old Testament. In our text, we get both their backgrounds, Haman the Agite and Mordecai the Jew. Now, add the word, uh, add the, the, the suffix ite to any name and you get a people group, a, a follower of a certain time and place and people, uh, the descendants of, the followers of, or those who live in a certain place. So we have the Canaanites who are the descendants of Noah's grandson Canaan and they live in the land named Canaan. We have the Ammonites, we have the Moabites, we have the Edomites. We do it in our modern language as well. We add an ite to a name. Uh, We have Hutterites, those who are families descended from and followers of the teaching of Jacob Hutter. We have people called Mennonites. They are the followers of or the people of the teaching of Menno, Mennonites. And so that agite in Haman's name tells us a story. It's like saying Jeff the American or Ezra the African or Freddie the Mexican. It tells us where they come from. Now the problem is Agite only appears here in the book of Esther. Nowhere else in the Bible. But if you drop the ite off the end and you look up the name Agag, a whole family tree opens up to us. You see, we meet King Agag in 1 Samuel 15 when Saul is sent into battle against the Amalekites. And their king's name is Agag. And the whole history now opens up before us because the Amalekites were one of Israel's arch rivals. The first significant reference we have to this nation is in Exodus 17. As the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt, they're approaching the promised land, and the Amalekites come out to do battle with them and say, you are not going to pass through our land. Now notice again the ite, the Amalekites. Who were they the descendants of? a man named Amalek. And who was he? Well, Genesis 36 tells us that one of Esau's grandsons was named Amalek. And by now you're going, and who's Esau? Just stay with me, please. Don't turn off that television. This gets even more interesting. Maybe you don't know who Esau is, but I'm sure that many of you know the fathers of the Jewish nation, the Judeo-Christian heritage. We talk about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But don't forget that Jacob was a twin. 
He had a twin brother named Esau, and there was a major battle between these two. There was bad blood from the get-go. In fact, we are told that in their mother's womb, when Rebecca is pregnant with them, that her pregnancy was tumultuous, that these two infants were fighting with one another. And the Lord tells her, there are two nations at war in your womb. Now, we don't have time to go further down this trail, but it is fascinating history. Believe me, it's fascinating. Just stay with me. If you trace their ancestry back far enough, you will find out that Haman and Mordecai are actually very distant cousins. They are removed by dozens and dozens of generations for sure, but if they pulled out their family tree and they looked back up that family tree and they compared notes, Haman might say, my great, 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 great granddaddy was a man named Isaac. And Mordecai might say, oh my goodness, you've got to be kidding because my great, 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 great granddaddy is also named Isaac. See, family feuds are the legends of history. And they make for great historical fiction, and sure, a lot of times there's more myth than substance. Sometimes they're far overplayed, but there are very real and deadly family feuds written into human history. Maybe the most famous in English literature, Shakespeare's story, the hatred between the Montague and Capillet families. And the tragic consequence when two of their children fall in love with one another and want to marry and their families oppose, and it will take the tragic death by suicide of Romeo and Juliet to get these two families to reconcile. The English have the War of the Roses. Scotland has the MacDonald and the Campbell feud. My wife comes from the McDonald line. She won't even buy Campbell's soup today. The U.S. have the Hatfields and McCoys. Northview has witnessed the Bucknam and Akoti feud for years. So what motivated Haman? It was far more than a personal affront. The Amalekites and the Israelites were sworn enemies, and now, generations later, two grandsons of these feuding families find themselves captives in the same concentration camp. One of them rises to power, and the other refuses to bow, and so the first plans a great and final solution. It just so happened that an Amalekite is promoted to power. What do we take from chapter 3? We have to land it. It is a sobering text for sure. But let me remind you that there are two storylines that are always being played out. There is both the macro storyline of our lives and of history, and there is the micro storyline. And the micro storyline of Esther 3 is representative of the macro story of the Bible. And there are many applications that we could take, and you've heard some of them already in weeks one and two, and you'll hear them again in the following weeks. But let me remind you of this. Number one, that in the darkest days, God is still working. In the darkest days, God is still working. Romans 8 promises us that God works all things together for good to those who love him. For God's children, he turns all events ultimately for their good. The Lord has promised us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You may not see, you may not hear, you may not sense my presence. It may appear that God is hidden, but take comfort. He is at work regardless of the crisis. Secondly, we also need to remember that God orchestrates the macro events of history for his glory. We don't see the whole story of history. We can look back and piece some things together, but we don't know the future. One example would be to talk to Iranian Christians today who trace their Christian faith heritage back to Jewish captivity. We might say Christianity exists today in part in Iran and Iraq because of the presence of the Jewish nation centuries ago. If you look at Acts chapter 2, there's a fascinating piece there when it says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. Today we would say there were Iraqis and Iranians present at Pentecost. 
God-fearing Jews from those nations who heard the preaching of the gospel the day the Holy Spirit birthed the New Testament church, they were present in Jerusalem. And why were there Persians, Iranians present at Pentecost to hear the gospel preached? Because hundreds of years earlier, God had sent his people to Babylon. And we'll come back to this theme in Esther chapter 8, that there were many converts to Judaism. And there are many, many people listening to this message whose parents or grandparents fled from some crisis in one part of the world and came to North America literally as refugees. And God intended that tragedy for their good and the good of their children. But number three, we should also not confuse our micro crises with the macro story. See, every storyline typically has a series of mini crises that contribute to the color and the feel of the story. But every story also has a macro theme, a a meta narrative that overrides the entire story. And our challenge always is to keep the small things small and the big things big and the wisdom to know the difference, as one of my mentors used to say. You might ask yourself in the crisis you're in right now, what's the worst case scenario in the current crisis that I face? Some of you might say, well, I'll get cut from the team because they're no longer playing sports. I don't get to graduate from middle school or high school or college. Some might say I could lose my home, I could lose my business. Others might think if I contract this virus, I might die. And then we need to ask the question, yes, and then what? Then what? In the worst case scenario, even if that happens, the story is not over. Your story is not over. And for people as faith, we recognize that life is not our final end and that this world is not our final destination, that this is not our home. And so we've got to raise our eyes to the macro story, the salvation of humanity. You and I, just like the Jews in Esther 3, have an appointment with death. The human race has an appointment with death. But we have also been given an invitation to life. You see, the Bible tells us that a death verdict has been issued over the entire human race because of our sin, our rebellion. We are headed for certain death, eternal separation from the presence of God. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has come to offer us life, that he came to save, to deliver, or to rescue saving us from the rightful penalty for our sin and our rebellion. And how he accomplished this was by taking our place in death, offering his own perfect life as a substitute. And you see, here is the very sober reality, that without a mediator to step in in the book of Esther on behalf of the Jewish nation, they would surely perish. Xerxes' edict would be carried out in 11 months. The appointment with death will happen. And so too with the macro story of humanity that without a mediator to step in on our behalf to do what we cannot do for ourselves, we have a certain appointment with death. And so Jesus steps between sinful humanity and a holy God and he reconciles those who are willing to receive his gift of life. We are living in a time of crisis. It's a time like any other in our generation, a global pandemic. But we dare not confuse a micro crisis with a macro. You see, COVID-19 will eventually pass. The world has been through pandemics before. It may take months, or in worst case, it might take years, but eventually a vaccine will be found, human immunity will be gained, life will regain some sense of normality. We will get through this. And on the scale of our lifetimes and on the scale of eternity, it will just be a blip on the radar. But there is a macro crisis that we all face, and it is a crisis we cannot avoid. That we have an appointment with death. 
that there's an enemy who would destroy us for all of eternity, but that there is also a Savior who has come to do what we can't do for ourselves. You see, there is a way out of this crisis, and that way has a name. His name is Jesus. Let me pray with you. Father, I pray that as we study this book of Esther, that you would take the principles from an ancient people group facing a crisis unlike the crisis that we face today and nevertheless needing to cry out to you. And that you would take the times that we are in today, Lord, and that you would use this crisis for your glory. We are asking, Lord, that by your spirit that you would take and use this COVID-19 crisis to stir up a spiritual awakening across our land and literally around the world. That as people's idols have been shaken, as retirement savings have declined, as people have lost their health and lost their jobs, their worlds are being shaken. And Father, we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would move around the globe, that you would awaken people to their need, not just to make it through this crisis, but that they would be awakened to the greater crisis, that they must be reconciled to their Creator. Oh God, would you move in power. I pray for those who are listening to this message today. Whatever their circumstance, would you encourage them? Would their eyes be lifted, eyes on you, eyes on Jesus, eyes past the storm, May we with faith move forward knowing, Lord, you are still on the throne. You are still in control. And to your glory and to our great joy, in the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for the message, Pastor Mark. I'm looking forward to next week as we continue the series in Esther. Now, we recognize that this is a time of transition and difficulty for many people but as you are able, we'd love to encourage you to consider giving to our church. We're reaching out into our community, and we're continuing to preach God's word, and we would love it if you would partner with us in this mission. There are many different ways to give to our church. You're able to give online. We also have set up text to give, or you can mail or drop off checks here at the Downs Road campus. And now, let's go back to Andrew and the team as they continue to lead us in worship through song.
Thank you for joining us this week. I hope you're able to join us again next week. I'd love to send you out with this benediction from Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20. Today, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, loving the Lord your God and holding fast to him, for he is your life. Have a great week, everyone.